You know, they say to me, uh, how does it feel to you to be involved in a photo that ended World War II? I was downtown Newport. I was 19 years old that day of the Japs hit Pearl. I was not in the Navy. And I was with a buddy of mine, we were in a restaurant, killing time. And uh, all of a sudden we came walking out of the restaurant and the people outside were saying, the Japs have hit Pearl Harbor. Well, my age group and at that time wanted to get the Japs. Everybody wanted to get revenge. And I guess my age group did volunteer. As a matter of fact, I was fishing with my father. And of course, it was late in the summer, and our fishing season was over for the year. And I went right down to the recruiting office. We were peed off, my age group. And when we come out of that restaurant that day, and the people are out in the streets, you know, everyone's talking, the Japs hit Pearl Harbor, the Japs hit Pearl Harbor. And our fishing season had just ended, and I had quit high school, I quit everything. And I was fishing with the old man. And now that the season was over, I was, I said, God damn, rather than have the Army draft me, I think I'll go, go find out what the Navy's got. So I went down to the re Navy recruiting office, and uh, I said, well, I'm thinking about you know, what's in the Navy for me? And uh, the guy says, oh, you're a fisherman? I says, yeah, I'm a fisherman. And he says, well, you know, the Navy just ordered something like 175 ships, to all destroyers, to be built. They built 175 of them. And they're going to have a problem serving these new ships. They don't have the expertise in the young guys in the country today. And the guy at the recruiting office says, you know, you with commercial fishing experience, he says, you can go into the Navy with a promotion. So I said, that sounds pretty good. So uh, I thought it over and thought it over, and finally I joined the Navy. And they promoted me to a second-class petty officer, which was a coxswain rate, was like uh, a deckhand on a ship, boatswain mate. And when I went into the Navy in uh, 1942, uh, after a few days in the Navy, there was like the company, the group of guys that I was assigned with in the Navy. They called it a company, and it was Company 146, and I guess about 150 guys in the company. So after a short time, and of course, there were some guys that did come in the Navy that had some kind of a skill that the Navy tried to work these guys, because they didn't have the number of men in the fleet. And the war started... So after a few days, out of 150 men, I guess they got around 25 of us guys that had some kind of experience, like I was a fisherman. So they called us down to the office, and they said, you know, you guys have got some skill, and the Navy's building a lot of ships. So out of that 150 and that, that was in my company, I guess there was probably about 15 or 20 guys, and I was one of them. 
that they shipped right out into the war, right out into the fleet and the new ships that were being built. So when it comes the day the ship, they call all these guys and ship them out, they told me, so you go home, service, you do your boot time, which is the recruiting time in the Navy. And uh, the Navy's not sure what they want to do with you. We see you have a lot of experience on the water, and I was running the fishing boat with the old man. And uh, they said, you're going to get orders when you go home. So they shipped off about 15 or 20 guys out of 150 out to the fleet. And the war started in the Pacific. So I go home, and uh, I'm waiting for orders. I said, Jesus, I said, they shipped these other guys all out, this 15 or 20 guys. I says, uh, I wonder why the hell they didn't ship me out too. So I went into the office on the Navy base, and I says, what happened? You know? And they says, well, they gave you a bosom mate rate coming in the Navy. And they feel as though that your experience as a kid on the water, and you run, you can run a boat, uh, they want to take that rate away from you that they promise you're coming in the Navy, and they want to send you to quartermaster school. So I says, what the hell is a quartermaster doing in the Navy? So he says, well, a quartermaster does celestial navigation and can read a blinker light and send messages by light. So the guy even said to me, he says, well, that's a hell of a lot better rate going into the Navy than what you've already been offered. Well, anyway, the Sullivans, that's just about the time they got killed. They got killed November 13, 1941. And the President of the United States ordered Bethlehem Steel out in San Francisco to build a new destroyer and name it the Sullivans. And just about this time, I finished school. I come out of school with a promotion. And they shipped me out to California, San Francisco. And I was there for a few days, and I'm assigned to the Sullivans. Well, she wasn't even complete. She was still building her. And so one day, the navigator, so they're putting us in a big building, the guys for this ship, guys for the other ships that are forming crews before the ships are even built. So they shipped me out to San Francisco, and finally I'm living in this big building. Finally some kids say, what the hell's your name? And I says, Mendoza. They said, for Christ's sake, we've been looking for you for weeks. You're, you've been assigned to the Sullivans. And that, that was beautiful. That was perfect. That was a, I really loved that. So every day I had to go over where they were building a ship and the navigational equipment was coming in, the charts and everything for the ship, and I had to store all that stuff. So I was the first guy assigned to the Sullivans that wasn't a Sullivan. I guess the Navy started out. Matter of fact, when we shipped and sailed for the Pacific, when the ship was complete, we had like 25 Sullivans in the crew. And I guess they felt that, Jesus Christ, if they start naming everybody Sullivan, there's going to be a lot of confusion. So I was the first guy assigned to the Sullivans that was not a Sullivan. <laughs> so I come over and meet the 15 or 20 guys that's already assigned to the Sullivans. And I said, what the hell are they doing bringing a Portuguese into this crew? And I remember telling the guys there, they were all Sullivan. I said, for Christ's sake, you Sullivan guys, Uncle Sam wants to make sure we bring the ship back. 
I said, none of you guys know how to navigate, and they feel that you Sullivans are going to lose the goddamn ship anyway. So anyway, we joked about that. But I was the first guy assigned to the Sullivans that wasn't a Sullivan. Do you, do you, <clears throat> you talked about how angry the country was after Pearl Harbor. Mm. Now, the first time that America was able to strike back was the Doolittle mission. Yeah. In, in April of 1942. Did that lift the morale of, of the soldiers and the country? Do you feel as though when you, fought, when you heard that they had hit Tokyo and Japan? Well, I wasn't in the Navy then. That was before I went in. I went in in November of 42. And actually, uh, you know, there, there wasn't really, there was excitement about the Japs in the war. But the, the excitement really showed was when, when America got out there and started fighting. And, of course, the, the Japs were getting hell. They got their shit kicked out of them. And, of course, the American Navy, there was no power in the world like we had. We had four task groups, and each task group had four aircraft carriers. So I made a total of 16 aircraft carriers and made a total of 12 battleships in the four groups, and also 12 cruisers in the four groups. And then there was a total of around 25 destroyers to one group, so we had four. We had over 100 destroyers in Task Force 38. And of course, I was up on the bridge, so I, knew everything that was going on. And of course, the Japs, they got the shit kicked right out of them. And of course, the first place where the Japs get hurt the most <coughs> before I went in the Navy was at Wake, Wake Island, when they broke the Jap code. And, and someone figured the code out that Admiral they were going to hit Wake Island, the Japs. And, of course, the American Navy was waiting for them there. And I don't remember exactly, but I think the Japs lost three aircraft carriers at Wake. <coughs> and I think we lost the Yorktown. At Midway. 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 When you, when you talk about that time, um, I just want to get back to what I asked earlier. Um, the Japanese, early in the war, felt they were invincible. They had taken over Wake, Guam, Hong yeah, Kong, yeah. Singapore, the Philippines. Um, how important was it to, to, to hit them hard and hit them early to let them know that they weren't invincible? Well, that's what that strike of Doolittle hit in Japan. <coughs> I think that jolt of the Japs, I don't think the Japs ever expected to get hit. But, uh, of course, then I was a young kid when that happened, and I, I don't think I was even in the Navy when, the, when they hit Japan. Was the, the Hornet, I guess, was one of the carriers. But, uh, and, and actually, the population in the country really didn't have, I don't know, a real feeling about the war. They knew that we got clobbered at Pearl, but it wasn't until afterwards that the American population began to feel a little bit or understand a little bit about it, especially when all the kids start getting drafted. That's when they begin to realize that, uh, you know, this was going to be serious. What were you doing in Times Square on that particular day in 1945? Well, we had been in the Pacific for two years. And at that point of the war, we had taken over everything in the Pacific. And we operated always with the big, big force. This was enormous. This Task Force 38 and Task Force 58. When it was Task Force 38, 
That's when Halsey was out there and he was in command. So Halsey was in, in command of task force or the third fleet. So everything in the organization out there, I see I was up on the bridge where I worked, so I I knew the whole buildup of the Navy out there. So everything under Halsey's command began with a three. He was command of third fleet. So when he was in the carrier group, that was Task Force 38. Then in 38, there was 38.1, 38.2, 38.3 and 38.4. So we had four of these groups. And Halsey, he was on the New Jersey. That's where he rode, on the battleship New Jersey. She was number 62. And matter of fact, Halsey's code name on the radio voice circuits, his call was Aztec, A-Z-T-E-C. And I still remember all this, because you know, I was in the position to, I was up on a bridge all the time working with the navigator, and any time I come down off the bridge of my ship, the crew wanted to know, where the hell are we at, where are we going, what's going on? They knew I had all the dope. But uh, that Task Force 38, Admiral Mitzer, he was in command of Task Force 38, and I guess he was a, he was a genius. Well, he was commander of the Hornet for the Doolittle raid. He commanded the Hornet. Yeah. So, the Pacific, the war is won. You're in Times Square. Why were you there? Well, now back in '45. Now, at that time of the war, we had just taken Okinawa, and we had orders that we were going to put the army, the American army, onto Okinawa. And I guess they felt that it was going to take about six months to get the American army out of Europe. The war was over in Europe. And I guess the top brass in America felt it's going to take six months to get the American army out of Europe get them all the way out there for the invasion of Japan. So a few ships out there, like the Sullivans, we've been out there for two years. I guess they says, send them guys back to the States. So in July of 45, we got our orders to come home. And we had been, I'd been out there for two years. So we come home, and just before we left out there, the aircraft carrier, the Bunker Hill, she got hit. She took a couple of suicide dive bombers. And we was right alongside the Bunker Hill. And we was ordered to go alongside of her. And there was a lot of men on the Bunker Hill that were trapped in the fires. All them, it was just before sunrise, they, the Jap planes crashed, suicide dive. And all the Bunker Hill planes, probably about 90 planes, had all been refueled and reloaded with weapons and to be uh, launched at sunrise to hit Japan. So when those two Jap planes crashed into the deck, some of them planes on deck started exploding and burning up. And the Bunker Hill from 90 planes, all their fuel was on the flight deck and the hell of a fire. And we was close by her. And, and when we got close to a lot of the sailors on the Bunker Hill, they were trapped in the fires and in the flames. Well, they started jumping off the Bunker Hill and we picked up hundreds of them out of the water. I got all this stuff down below. So you, they sent you home after that? They sent you home on leave? Yeah, they sent the ship back to the States. And how was that to be back in the States after a couple of years? What did it feel like? Oh, Christ. I, I remember we were in Lady Gulf in the Philippines. 
And the skipper, the skipper and I, we worked together. I was the quartermaster on the bridge. And I worked with the navigator. So me and the captain, we were buddies. And the navigator, I was like number two navigator on the Sullivans. Uh, there was an officer above me. So anyway, we, we uh, our navigator, he was ordered to fly back to the States. And he took all the job orders that our ship needed when we got back to the States. So he flew back with everything our ship needed to be repaired and refitted or whatever. So then I was the number one navigator on the Sullivan. So we came back to the States in the middle of July. Well, we got into San Francisco in July, I guess. And the navigator's waiting on the dock at Mare Island for us as we're coming in. And the navigator, him and I were like this, because we worked together out there, doing all the navigation together. So the navigator, when he left the Sullivan's to fly back, he says, when you get back to the States, Mendoza, how the hell do you want to go home? And I said, I don't know, I guess I have to fly home. So, so the navigator said to me, okay, I'll have a reservation for you the minute the ship hits that you can fly home. So we got into Mare Island, we come back to the States, took over a month coming back. And the navigator, he's standing on the dock and he sees me on the ship and he, I go over to him, he says, Mendoza, here's your tickets to fly home. You owe me so much. I was the first guy off the Sullivan's when we come back to the States. Even before, I, we know the ship wasn't even tied up and I had my orders to get my uniform on and here's my tickets and fly home. I was the first guy off the ship. So... So anyway, then I come home to Newport and my younger sister married a Navy guy here in Newport. So when I got back here at home, I met my new brother-in-law for the first time. And he was from Long Island, New York originally. So when I met the new brother-in-law, after a few days, the brother-in-law said to me, he says, he says, his parents were coming from Long Island up here to visit him. And the new brother-in-law says, we were fishermen, my family. So the brother-in-law says, can we get a, rig up a big, nice seafood dinner? He says, when my parents are here, I said, look, I can get all the seafood we need. So I met my new brother-in-law's parents, they drove up from Long Island, and they brought their niece with them. So I met the niece, and I said, holy Jesus, she beautiful. So they were in Newport about a week, so I took the niece, and I was showing her around Newport. And then finally, after about a week, my brother-in-law's parents went back to Long Island and of course, they took their niece back with them. So I kept in touch with the niece by phone. And now my leave was running out and the war still on. So I said, well, I'll make reservations to fly out of New York when I go, it's time to go back to my ship. So I make reservations out of New York. So I went to New York the last few days of my leave and I met the niece. So her and I was my last day in New York. We were in the Radio City Music Hall. And I had my reservations to fly late that night. And while the show was going, I was watching the Rockettes the whole bit. 
And all of a sudden, there's a hell of a commotion out on the streets. And the people out on the streets are pounding on the doors of Radio City. And in the theater, we're wondering, what the hell's going on outside there? So finally, they stopped the show, and they put the lights on, and they said, the Japs have surrendered, the war's over. Well, the people in Radio City went wild. We come down into Times Square, and Christ, there's a million people there. <clears throat> so my date and I, we go into Child's Bar, and the bartender put all the glasses up on the bar, and he's pouring the booze. And whatever he poured, you drank. So after a while, now it's getting time that I know we're gonna, I got to go back out to Long Island with my date because her father was going to drive me to the airport late that night. So we're coming down into Times Square. The war's over, and boy, I'm telling you, Times Square was wild. And I had quite a few drinks in me. And I saw the nurse. Now, let's go back five months in the war. We're still back in the Pacific. When the Bunker Hill took those suicide dive bombers, and we picked up over 100 men out of the water, and some of them poor bastards were hurting. And late that day, we met the hospital ship, the Solus was the name of the hospital ship. And we're transferring the wounded onto the hospital ship. And I saw what those nurses did that day to these guys, and they're hurting. And they're still in the back of my head. So now back in Times Square when the war ends and I saw the nurse, if that girl did not have a nurse's uniform on, I never would have done that. It, it, what I remembered out there. And that's what did it. And then it was... Of course, after it was over, I went my way and the nurse went her way, thought nothing of it. Then, of course, the, a few days before that day, they had dropped the A-bomb on Japan. It was in August. And, of course, the people are wondering, what the hell is the A-bomb? They're reading the papers. America has dropped the A-bomb. And I was wondering, too, I said, what the hell's an A-bomb? We never heard of an A-bomb. But uh, we figured, well, it must have been something great because that A-bomb got some publicity. I think it was on August the 8th that bomb was dropped. Uh, so when that day come up in Times Square, it, it, you know, uh, during that World War II, there was like uh, 15 million of my age group in all the services. The Army, the Navy, the Air Corps. And, and when the war, and, and those early war years, the parents of all these servicemen they were the ones that were absorbing the headaches and the problem of the war was the parents. And just about every household in America had a son or two, you know, in the war somewhere, because there was 15 million of us. So when the war stopped in New York and Times Square, it was the adult people in this country that went wild. Everyone thinks it was the Navy there, and the, well, there was a few Navy people there. But the parents of all the guys in the service are the ones that had the full brunt of that World War II was the parents. And they're the ones that celebrated. 
Rita was with you in Times Square. Yeah. <clears throat> what did she think when you're grabbing this nurse and kissing this nurse? Did she know that you had a few drinks in you and everything? And <laughs> oh yeah, well, well, here like, well, you know, uh, well, she thought nothing of it. Everybody was excited. People were. I didn't see too many people kissing people, but I know that everybody was high, I guess you'd say. And the fact that people were grabbing one another and no, no one thought it was anything wrong. No, this, you know, everyone kind of felt that it's the excitement of the war ending. That's, that's what did it. When did you first see the photo? Yeah, it's about three or four years after. There's a friend of mine, he was a farmer here in Middletown. And of course, we're at the war's over a few years. And one day, this guy, Francis Sylvia, he's deceased today. But Francis Sylvia called me up one day. And he says, where the hell were you the day the war ended? And I says, I was in Times Square the moment the war ended. I says, he says, well, I know goddamn well you was. I said, how the hell do you know where I was? You're asking me where I was. He says, well, I got a Life magazine here. And there's a picture of a sailor grabbing a nurse. He says, he says I know it's you. I said, you're kidding me. He says, I know it's you. I said, well, bring the magazine over the house. And he brings the Life magazine, and I looked at it. And my first reaction, what I saw was the hand, the first thing. And I guess it was a, a, the, the sensation I got. It was like looking in a mirror. I said, God damn, that is me. I hadn't remembered nothing about the kiss and the excitement of Times Square a few years. But the minute I saw it, and he picked it out, this guy Francis Sylvia, the minute he looked at it, well, the first thing that showed was the size of the hand. And, of course, when I looked at the picture, and I looked at it and looked at it, and then I began to study it, and then I found my initials tattooed on my right arm. It's in the photo. So, and I knew it was me. I, I could see the face. I knew it was me. And Francis, to pick me up, well, he had to have a good idea of what the hell I looked like. Because, you know, most of it's blocked. And I can show you all this. I got all the photos over here. And what happened after that, as far as, um, okay, that's me, what did you do then? Did you try to contact somebody? I mean, No, Life magazine come out. I've got the magazines down below. Life come out, I guess it was in August. Uh, 45, I guess. And... In the magazine, they had the sailor picture. And I've got it down below. And it had, now if the sailor can recognize himself, would he please come forward? Well, I contacted Life magazine. And Life magazine asked me to come to New York. And I went to New York, and they had the photographer in Times Square. Life magazine was there. And I got this pictures, too, when I approached it. So they got me in Times Square, and Life says to me, they put me in a hotel that night. And they said, look, in the morning, we're going to send a limousine, pick you up at the hotel. You come down here in Times Square. He says, we're going to have the nurse... Greta Freeman standing in the middle of Times Square. Well, before all this, Life magazine asked me, who's the nurse? I said, well, there's four girls claiming to be the nurse. But 
the one that's getting the most credit, she stood four foot ten. Now I stand six foot two. And I told life, I said, she is not the nurse. I says, her height would come up to here on me. And if you compare her height to the nurse in the famous photo, it's stupid. So life says, well, who is the nurse? I said, well, I don't know who the nurse is. This is two years afterwards. I said, there's only one girl out of the four that her height matches my height, and it's this Greta Freeman. I said, she's, I said, the life, she's the only one that can be the, I said, I'm the guy, so I says, she's the only one that can be the nurse. <clears throat> so Life Magazine invited Greta and I to come back to Times Square. They put me in a hotel and they say in the morning, we're gonna pick you up, you come down into Times Square. And we're gonna have Greta in the middle of Times Square. You walk out, you go up to her, and the minute you walk over to Greta, we're gonna start filming you meeting her. I said, I don't know who the hell she is or what she looks like. They said, well, we'll point her out to you. So I get out of the limousine, I'm coming across Times Square, and there's a million people in Times Square. And the guys, they're pointing to me. That's the girl right there, and she's standing there in the middle of Times Square. So I walk up to her and I grab her by the hand and I said something like, well, it's finally great to finally get to meet you after all these years. So I grabbed her and I kissed her because I knew they had the cameras going. I knew that's what they expected. And that's the first time I had met Greta was that day in Times Square. And in the background, they had her so located in Times Square that the Times building was, would be in the background of them when they photographed me meeting her. And you know the tape that runs around the Times building? Well, the tape running around the Times building read at that moment, it had to be you. And I've got this. But life would never admit I was a guy, and they haven't yet. Why? Well, then finally one time life invited me back to Times Square to meet the photographer, Eisenstadt. And I met Eisenstadt. He was, I think he was 94 years old. And, and Eisenstadt, I met him. And he's got the whole thing all screwed up. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure that he was the photographer. But he got the credit for the photo. And there was another guy, Johnson. He was a sailor. He was a photographer in the Navy. And he also took a picture at the same time. So there was two photographers that photographed that kiss at the same moment. And I know the difference, because I've had both them photos. As a matter of fact, years and years afterwards, I met Johnson. And this Johnson guy, he is a son of the Johnson & Johnson pharmaceutical people. So I've met him. But, uh, but the only admitting that life ever did is on that Times bill where it said it had to be you. And I'll show you this later. <clears throat> Why do you think it became such an iconic image? Well, if you saw the people, the adult people in Times Square, it, it happened in New York. You know, that's why. I love, if that happened any place else in the United States, it never would have got that exposure. It's New York. And that's what did it. But then life invites me down to the they want to talk to me, and I go down to the Times building. And I meet uh, Ann Morell. So I go in the Times building, 
And I had to go check in over there. They had secret service men in there. I had to go check at a desk. And the guy, he says, you want to go up to the 25th floor in the life building? And they said, we're going to escort you up there. I couldn't even get in the time life building. I had to go get checked in there with these guards there. They brought me over to the elevator, and they escorted me up, and I met Ann Morell. I think it was up on the 25th floor. So I'm talking to Ann Morell, and she's saying to me, oh, you're from Newport. She says, I got relatives in the fish business in Newport. So anyway, I spent, I thought I was going to meet the managing editor of Life. And there I am talking with Ann Morell, and after a while I said to Ann Morell, Ann, I'm very disappointed in this meeting. I'm getting the hell out of here. I says, I'm not happy at all the way this meeting. I said, I thought I was going to meet the big shots here at Life. I says, uh, I'm going, I'm leaving, I'm getting out of here. Oh, please don't go, she says. She says, the gang out here on the 25th floor, they want to meet you. So, okay. So we walk out on the 25th floor, and there must have been 30 or 40 people out there preparing the next issue of Life magazine. And when I can walk it out into that big room, I could feel them eyeballs out of that group of Life people. They had them eyeballs on me, and these people were all experts in photography. And I, I, I could sense that they were sizing me up from head to toe and back. And I got over there to them, and there was a girl that came up with me on the elevator. She said, I know who you are. You're the sailor in the picture. And I said, how do you know I'm the sailor? She said, oh, I can tell. You're the sailor. So she escorts me up into that room there with all these guys. And right away, this group that employees of life, they're all around me. And boy, I was getting the eyeballs. And finally, after a while, one or two of them said, well, who's the nurse? And I says, I don't know who the nurse is. And they says, uh, geez, we'd like to know. I says, you people, I says, I'm very disappointed. I've been here for hours. I says, and you had all these months to identify me, and you haven't done it yet. And now you're asking me to identify the nurse? Am I the sailor? And they turned their backs to me. And I finally, after a while, I said, well, I'm getting the hell out of here because I'm not happy the way this thing is going. I said, I'm getting the hell out of here, and I'm going home. And then last, after a while, they gave me that picture of the, the Times building with the tape going around it, and I'll show it to you. Why, why has it become such a controversy and when did it really start to become a controversy over... Because guys were coming out of the woodwork saying yeah. it was me, and it seemed like all of a sudden it took on this importance of, you know, you've got ten guys claiming to be whoever it was. Yeah, there was over... Why? Well, I think they felt that whoever they identify as a sailor is going to take legal action against them. And I think they felt that maybe, maybe it was better to keep uh, the identity of the sailor, never identify him. Maybe they figured it would be to their advantage. And, uh, and I, I never got any satisfaction with the photographer, Eisenstadt, either. He was... He was there that day in Times Square. 
How do you feel about people who come out and say that they were the sailor? The guy in Houston, other guys? Oh, I've been on the air with them, face to face. And I could eliminate every one of them. Why don't I show you the evidence I've got? I've got this. I've got this. I've got Richard Benson. He's a dean of art and professor of photography at Yale University. Well, I took legal action against life, my lawyer, Pat Hayes in Newport. Pat Hayes called up the Johnson family in Newport. Now, this Johnson family, I hope I got that name right. The Johnson family, they were the uh, Greystone uh, engravers. So Pat Hayes called all, got a hold of this. Johnson, that's his name. Yeah. I'm sure I don't know. Well, anyway... My lawyer gets this, this photo expert and he tells Pat Hayes, the lawyer, he's bring Mendoza in, I want to see him. So I went and I met the photo expert. Today he's at Yale University. And I'm talking to this photo expert and we're talking about the photo, this and that. And he finally said to me, let me see your left arm. I said, you mean the right arm? I said, there's nothing on the left arm. He said, well, I want to see your left arm. I said, well, there's the right arm, because I had in the back of my head, I had the tattoo of the show, this expert. And he's laughing like, after a while he said to me, well, he says, I found something on your left arm. And he says that I had not brought it to his attention. He says, I found something that he says that he had found in the photos. And now when he brought me in to meet me, he had it in the back of his head. He wanted to see what the hell that was on the left arm. And no one ever mentioned that in all those years. So when he says, I want to see your left arm, so I showed him. He said, that's in the photo. So he matched that up to the yep. left arm, and he was the only one who ever did that. He was the guy that brought it to my attention. I knew I had it. What is it? I don't know, some, a when, he called it a when. I knew I had it, but I never, I never thought that that was showing the photo. It's a bump underneath the skin? Yeah. It's there. It's been there all those years. And you've had that as a child? And yeah, yeah. So then finally, my wife, she starts looking at the picture. And she said to me one day, you know that nurse's face? That, no, not the nurse. That girl's face on the sailor's right shoulder my wife says, I think that's me, meaning her. And I said, no, that's not you were on the other side. And she got disgusted with me that I wasn't supporting her. And she says, well, I think that's her. And finally one day, I went to the old photos that we had in the house, and I dug out some photos of her of the same year and I said, God damn it, she can be identified. I've got the photos right here. So my wife can be identified in the photo. But she wasn't your wife then. She was... You were just yeah, no, then, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. When you look at all this and the links that have been taken to um, identify you, um, it's been a battle... To, to, to do that. Why, yeah. why is it so important to you that, is it because you want history to be right? Well, you know, everybody tells me, you know, they say to me, uh, how does it feel to you 
to be involved in a photo that ended World War II. That's what they put to me. Now, here's another thing. My father was born and my mother were married in Madeira Island, Portugal. And my father came to America in 1910. But before he come across, in Portugal those years when he was a kid and his brothers were kids, the Portuguese, to form a, a Portuguese army, would pull a son out of each family. So my father, his youngest brother was more or less appointed by the family, you're going in the Portuguese army to fill the obligation that the family had to Portugal. Well, this guy went off to Africa and two other kids from the same village where they were lived Two other kids went with my father's youngest brother. And then the three of them were shipped off to Africa because Portugal had a lot of territories in Africa. Well, after a period of time, the other two kids come back home to Madeira. And when they came back, my father heard, the family heard, that the other two kids have come back home. And they said, well, where the hell's their brother? My father, uh, so my father goes and he looks up the two kids over in Madeira. And he says, how the hell come you guys come back? He says, how come my brother didn't come back? So my father never found out. And I, so for years and years, my father would get a tip that Maybe his brother is in Venezuela, because a lot of the Portuguese kids from back there was nothing but poverty over there, where they're from. A lot of the young guys were leaving Madeira and going all over to South America. So my father, once in a while, through all the years, we were kids growing up, and we can remember, I can remember, the old man. Anytime he got a tip that his youngest brother is here or he's there or something. Well, my father tried for 75 years to find this younger brother, and the family could never trace him anywhere. So after the war, my picture was circulating all over the world. And one night, in the middle of the night, I get a telephone call. And the guy says, you George Mendoza? And I says, yeah. Are you Portuguese? I says, yeah. And they says, uh, well, where was your people from? I says, my people were from Madeira, Portugal. And the guy says, I think we're related. I said, well, how do you think? Well, he says, their father was in Venezuela. And his name was Mendoza. His, my father tried for 75 years to find his brother, and he never found him. Now this picture is circulating in the newspaper in Venezuela. And there was a big article in the paper and the photo and names this guy in the photo as Mendoza. Now the kids from this offspring of this guy, they're cousins to me. I've, and when they saw that article in the picture and then they read the name in the article and they knew that they had an uncle that came to America, it would be my father. So here it is, about 50 or 75 years afterwards, I get a call in the middle of the night, and this guy says, who I am, the sailor picture, are you the guy? And we see the article, and we see the name, and we, they says they, they knew their father came from Madeira, and they also knew they had an uncle that went to America. And the guy says, I think we're cousins. 
And because of that picture, I found my cousins that the old man tried for 75 years he never found. A couple of years ago, they came to America to visit me. When you look, George, when you look at the iconic photos of World War II, you could say that, um, you know, the, the Iwo Jima photo in Suribachi is one of them. Um, you could say maybe a photo from, from Pearl Harbor. Um, there might be some stuff um, in Europe as well. There's only a handful of iconic photos from World War II, and yours, yours is one of them. Why is it so iconic in terms of... Is it because it's the end? It kind of symbolized the end of the war? Yeah. Is that how you feel? Or? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, World War II, you know, you had, the America's been involved in wars ever since then. But World War II... There was 15 million of us, my age group, in the services. 15 million. Which tells me just about every American family had a son or two or three at the war. And all the homes in those years, if, if, if a house had two sons, they had a, a thing hanging in the window with two stars on it. If they had three kids, they'd had this, like a pennant hanging in the window. It was the adult people in America that were involved in World War II. So when it all ended, it was the adult people in America, the ones that celebrated and went wild, like that day in Times Square. There wasn't many sailors there that, that did do any damage or celebrate, it was the people. And it was the adult people that I, I, I got, I flew out that night. And when I landed in Frisco, well, I had to wire back to Long Island because my date, more or less saying something while I've arrived. I've got a telegram, so I sent my date in New York, a telegram. I've got it downstairs here to show it to you. Where I flew that night, the day that the whole works, I flew that night out of New York to go to Frisco. My final question for you. Um, when you look at um, all the other guys who tried to prove that they were you in Times Square, um, What's your what were your thoughts about those guys and and how how did you debate them? Well, I've been on television, and they had a by phone, and they've had these imposters by phone, and we've had I don't know like a cross argument. They had nothing. And I can prove, they can't even prove where the spot was in Times Square where the nurse was kissed. You know, they, they say, oh, I come up out of the subway and I saw the nurse, I grabbed. Well, the, where I did kiss that girl, there's no subway station there. And I, can, I eliminated them all. They're all died off. None of them had a true proof that they could even get a shot at being the sailor in the picture. The biggest thing that I think the identification in that picture is my wife. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Are you proud to be that sailor? Oh, yeah. I've been through hell to get that recognition. Here's another point. You know, I don't tell this to many people because they think I've gone wacky. But uh, when I was assigned to the Sullivans, the ship, the Sullivan family in Waterloo, Iowa, lost five sons. <laughs> the Sullivans 
I say, uh, had the worst blow or disaster, far greater than any other family in America had. They lost five sons. <coughs> and now, after the war, a sailor from the Sullivan ship was ordered back to the States. And the war is still on. And I always felt that somehow it was meant to be a sailor from the Sullivans that was the navigator of that ship and the helmsman at all the battle stations, that it was the helmsman from the Sullivans that showed up in Times Square at the end of the war. And I feel that. Yeah. Even when years afterwards, or before this time in Times Square, when we had reunions, and we had a re reunion or two in Chicago that we've had them around the country. And I always had it in the back of my mind that I'm going to go to Waterloo, Iowa someday. And this was before the war even ended because I was on that ship, the Sullivans. And I wanted to go to Waterloo, and I did go, and I did changed the mind of half my crew on the Sullivan that went to the West Coast. And the group went with me because I said, we got to go to Waterloo, Iowa on the 50th anniversary of their death. And we went to Waterloo, I and a group of guys went with me. And the rest of them went up to Washington. And President Johnson had a big parade in Waterloo. And there's a big museum there. And we were the heroes of that whole parade. And President Johnson sent me and our guys from the Sullivans, he sent us a telegram thanking us for being there. Yeah. I feel all that. And during the war, the five Sullivan brothers were on the Juno. And the five Sullivan brothers, their father was also one of five brothers. And there was one of his father's brothers was in the Navy. And the, the Juno was, was being built up in Maine. And I think she was, uh, I think she was number 52 with AA cruises. My brother was on a identical ship as a Juno. Well, the five brothers, when they went into the Navy, they would not go in the Navy unless they were all allowed to stay together. And the Navy had a policy that no brothers could serve together. But anyway, they let the five brothers serve now on the Juno. So when the Juno was being built up in Maine, one of their uncles, Mike, Mike Sullivan, he wanted to serve with his five nephews on the Juno. So Mike goes up to Maine and he missed the Juno. So the Juno goes down through the Panama Canal. This Mike Sullivan, he was a little funny. <laughs> so Monk missed of serving with his five nephews. 
So the ship goes through the Panama Canal. So Mike, he goes down the Panama Canal. He missed the ship again. And then he heard that the ship was up the West Coast in California. And Mike tried to meet the ship to serve with his five nephews. He missed the ship every time. So then Mike was assigned to the ship I was on, the Sullivan's. So Mike served with, on the Sullivan's, the ship named after his five nephews, Mike. I have a final question for you. Um, this is it. Um, was the feeling in the country when the atomic bombs were dropped that it was the right decision? And do you still view that as the right decision? Oh, yeah. Why? Well, because what the Japs did to us, uh, nothing could equal what, I mean, as a bad thing, nothing would ever equal what the Japs did to us. You know, as, as a reason to attack them. No, we uh, guys in the service felt that it was fortunate that Harry Truman was president a lot of, especially the servicemen, they felt that if Harry Truman was not the president of the United States, that other presidents wouldn't have dropped the bomb. 